On the Frontier of Civilization from France at War by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. On the Frontier of Civilization. It's a pretty park, said the French artillery officer. We've done a lot for it since the owner left. I hope he'll appreciate it when he comes back. The car traversed a winding drive through woods, between banks embellished with little chalets of a rustic nature. At first the chalets stood their full height above ground, suggesting tea-gardens in England. Further on they sank into the earth, till, at the top of the ascent, only their solid brown roofs showed. Torn branches drooping across the driveway, with here and there a scorched patch of undergrowth, explained the reason for their modesty. The chateau that commanded these glories of forest and park sat boldly on a terrace. There was nothing wrong with it, except, if one looked closely, a few scratches or dints on its white stone walls, or a neatly drilled hole under a flight of steps. One such hole ended in an unexploded shell. "'Yes,' said the officer, "'they arrive here occasionally.' Something bellowed across the folds of the wooded hills. Something grunted in reply. Something passed overhead, querulously, but not without dignity. Two clear fresh barks joined the chorus, and a man moved lazily in the direction of the guns. "'Well, suppose we come and look at things a little,' said the commanding officer. An observation post. There was a specimen tree, a tree worthy of such a park, the sort of tree visitors are always taken to admire. A ladder ran up it to a platform. What little wind there was swayed the tall top, and the ladder creaked like a ship's gangway. A telephone bell tinkled fifty feet overhead. Two invisible guns spoke fervently for half a minute, and broke off like terriers choked on a leash. We climbed till the topmost platform swayed sickly beneath us. Here one found a rustic shelter, always of the tea-garden pattern, a table, a map, and a little window wreathed with living branches that gave one the first view of the devil and all his works. It was a stretch of open country, with a few sticks like old toothbrushes, which had once been trees, round a farm. The rest was yellow grass, barren to all appearance as the veldt. "'The grass is yellow because they have used gas here,' said an officer. "'Their trenches are—you can see for yourself.' The guns in the woods began again. They seemed to have no relation to the regularly spaced bursts of smoke along a little smear in the desert earth two thousand yards away, no connection at all with the strong voices overhead, coming and going. It was as impersonal as the drive of the sea along a breakwater. Thus it went— a pause, a gathering of sound like the race of an incoming wave, then the high-flung heads of breakers spouting white up the face of a groin. Suddenly a seventh wave broke and spread the shape of its foam like a plume overtopping all the others. Eh, "'That's one of our torpedoes, what you call trench-sweepers,' said the observer among the whispering leaves. Someone crossed the platform to consult the map with its ranges. A blistering outbreak of white smokes rose a little beyond the large plume. It was as though the tide had struck a reef out yonder. Then a new voice of tremendous volume lifted itself out of a lull that followed. Somebody laughed. Evidently the voice was known. Uh, "'That is not for us,' a gunner said. "'They are being waked up from—' And he named a distant French position. "'So-and-so is attending to them there.' We go on with our usual work. Look, another torpedo. The Barbarian Again a big plume rose, and again the lighter shells broke at their appointed distance beyond it. The smoke died away on that stretch of trench, as a foam of a swell dies in the angle of a harbour wall, and broke out afresh half a mile lower down. In its apparent laziness, in its awful deliberation, and its quick spasms of wrath, it was more like the work of waves than of men. 
and our high platform's gentle sway and glide was exactly the motion of a ship drifting with us towards that shore. The usual work, only the usual work, the officer explained. Sometimes it's here, sometimes above or below us. I have been here since May. A little sunshine flooded the stricken landscape, and made its chemical yellow look more foul. A detachment of men moved out on a road which ran towards the French trenches, then vanished at the foot of a little rise. Other men appeared, moving towards us with that concentration of purpose and bearing shown in both armies when dinner is at hand. They looked like people who had been digging hard. "'The same work, always the same work,' the officer said. "'And you could walk from here to the sea or to Switzerland in that ditch, "'and you'll find the same work going on everywhere. "'It isn't war.' "'It's better than that,' said another. "'It's the eating up of a people. "'They come and they fill the trenches, and they die, and they die, "'and they send more, and those die.' We do the same, of course, but look, he pointed to the large, deliberate smoke-heads renewing themselves along that yellowed beach. That is the frontier of civilization. They have all civilization against them, those brutes yonder. It's not the local victories of the old wars that we're after. It's the barbarian, all the barbarian. Now you've seen the whole thing in little. Come and look at our children. SOLDIERS IN CAVES We left that tall tree, whose fruits are death-ripened and distributed at the tingle of small bells. The observer returned to his maps and calculations. The telephone boy stiffened up beside his exchange, as the amateurs went out of his life. Someone called down through the branches to ask who was attending to Belial, let us say, for I could not catch the gun's name. It seemed to belong to that terrific new voice which had lifted itself for the second or third time. It appeared from the reply that if Belial talked too long, he would be dealt with from another point miles away. The troops we came down to see were at rest in a chain of caves which had begun life as quarries, and had been fitted up by the army for its own uses. There were underground corridors, antechambers, rotundas, and ventilating shafts with a bewildering play of cross-lights, so that wherever you looked you saw goyous pictures of men-at-arms. Every soldier has some of the old maid in him, and rejoices in all the gadgets and devices of his own invention. Death and wounding come by nature, but to lie dry, sleep soft, and keep yourself clean by forethought and contrivance is art and in all things the Frenchman is gloriously an artist. Moreover, the French officers seem as mother-keen on their men as their men are brother-fond of them. Maybe the possessive form of address, mon général, mon capitaine, helps the idea, which our men cloak in other and curter phrases. And those soldiers, like ours, had been welded for months in one furnace. As an officer said, half our orders now need not be given. Experience makes us think together. I believe, too, that if a French private has an idea, and they are full of ideas, it reaches his CO quicker than it does with us. The Sentinel Hounds The overwhelming impression was of the brilliant health and vitality of these men and the quality of their breeding. They bore themselves with swing and rampant delight in life while their voices, as they talked in the side caverns, among the stands of arms, were the controlled voices of civilization. Yet, as the lights pierced the gloom, they looked like bandits, dividing the spoil. One picture, though far from war, stays with me. A perfectly built, dark-skinned young giant had peeled himself out of his blue coat, and had brought it down with a swish upon the shoulder of a half-stripped comrade, who was kneeling at his feet with some footgear. They stood against a background of semi-luminous blue haze, through which glimmered a pile of coppery straw, half covered by a red blanket. By divine accident of light and pose, it resembled St. Martin giving his cloak to the beggar. There were scores of pictures in those galleries— notably a rock-hewn chapel, where the red of the cross on the rough canvas altar-cloth glowed like a ruby. 
Further inside the caves we found a row of little rock-cut kennels, each inhabited by one wise, silent dog. Their duties begin in at night with the sentinels and listening-posts. And believe me, a proud instructor, my fellow here knows the difference between the noise of our shells and the Bosch shells. When we came out into the open again, there were good opportunities for this study. Voices and wings met and passed in the air, and perhaps one young tree had not been bending quite so far across the picturesque park drive when we first went that way. "'Oh, yes,' said an officer, "'shells have to fall somewhere.' And, he added, with fine toleration, "'it is, after all, against us that the Bosch directs them. But come you and look at my dugout. It is the most superior of all possible dugouts. No, oh, come and look at our mess. It's the writs of these parts.' and they joyously told how they had got, or procured, the various fittings and elegancies, while hands stretched out of the gloom to shake, and men nodded welcome, and greeting all through that cheery brotherhood in the woods. Work in the fields. The voices and the wings were still busy after lunch, when the car slipped past the tea-houses in the drive, and came into a country where women and children worked among the crops. There were large, raw shell-holes by the wayside or in the midst of fields, and often a cottage or a villa had been smashed, as a bonnet-box is smashed by an umbrella. That must be part of Belial's work, when he bellows so truculently among the hills to the north. We were looking for a town that lives under shell-fire. The regular road to it was reported unhealthy, not that the women and children seemed to care. We took byways of which certain exposed heights and corners were lightly blinded by windbreaks of dried tree-tops. Here the shell-holes were rather thick on the ground, but the women and the children and the old men went on with their work with the cattle and the crops, and where a house had been broken by shells, the rubbish was collected in a neat pile, and where a room or two still remained usable, it was inhabited and the tattooed window-curtains fluttered as proudly as any flag. And time was when I used to denounce young France, because it tried to kill itself beneath my car-wheels, and the fat old women who crossed roads without warning, and the specially deaf old men who slept in carts on the wrong side of the road. Now I could take my hat off to every single soul of them, but that one cannot traverse a whole land bareheaded. The nearer we came to our town, the fewer were the people, till at last we halted in a well-built suburb of paved streets where there was no life at all. A wrecked town. The stillness was as terrible as the spread of the quick, busy weeds between the paving stones. The air smelt of pounded mortar and crushed stone. The sound of a footfall echoed like the drop of a pebble in a well. At first the horror of wrecked apartment-houses and big shops laid open makes one waste energy and anger. It is not seemly that rooms should be torn out of the sides of buildings, as one tears the soft heart out of English bread, that villa roofs should lie across the iron gates of private garages, or that drawing-room doors should flap alone and disconnected between two emptinesses of twisted girders. The eye wearies of the repeated pattern that burst shells make on stone walls, as the mouth sickens of the taste of mortar and charred timber. One quarter of the place had been shelled nearly level. The façades of the houses stood doorless, roofless, and windowless like staged scenery. This was near the cathedral, which is always a favourite mark for the heathen. They had gashed and ripped the sides of the cathedral itself, so that the birds flew in and out at will. They had smashed holes in the roof, knocked huge cantles out of the buttresses, and pitied and starred the paved square outside. They were at work, too, that very afternoon, though I do not think the cathedral was their objective for the moment. We walked to and fro in the silence of the streets, and beneath the whirring wings overhead. Presently a young woman, keeping to the wall, crossed a corner, an old woman opened a shutter, how it jarred, and spoke to her. The silence closed again, but it seemed to me that I heard a sound of singing, 
the sort of chant one hears in nightmare cities of voices crying from underground. In the cathedral. Nonsense, said an officer, who should be singing here? We circled the cathedral again, and saw what pavement stones can do against their own city, when the shell jerks them upward. But there was singing, after all, on the other side of a little door in the flank of the cathedral. We looked in, doubting, and saw at least a hundred folk, mostly women, who knelt before the altar of an unwrecked chapel. We withdrew quietly from that holy ground, and it was not only the eyes of the French officers that filled with tears. Then there came an old, old thing with a prayer-book in her hand, pattering across the square, evidently late for surface. "'And who are these women?' I asked. Oh, "'Some are caretakers, people who have still little shops here. There is one quarter where you can buy things. There are many old people, too, who will not go away. They are of the place, you see.' "'And this bombardment happens often?' I said. "'It happens always. Would you like to look at the railway station?' Of course it has not been so bombarded as the cathedral. We went through the gross nakedness of streets without people, till we reached the railway station, which was very fairly knocked about, but, as my friends had said, nothing like as much as the cathedral. Then we had to cross the end of a long street, down which the Bosch could see clearly. As one glanced up it, one perceived how the weeds, to whom men's war is the truce of God, had come back, and were well established the whole length of it, watched by the long perspective of open, empty windows. End of On the Frontier of Civilization From France at War by Rudyard Kipling Read by Andy Minter